deeply burned and her mother suffered a stroke uh, that paralyzed half her body. So she's pushing herself up in, in the picture, but she was, had been lying on a mat in their, their one-bedroom apartment in Damascus for the last two years. No medical care has, has come for either the mother or the daughter. And uh, their, her older brother was taken and tortured, so now he, uh, the, the techniques that were used have made it so that he, he doesn't speak well uh, and they have to keep him dr uh, drugged or he becomes violent. So this is the situation that this family is living in at this moment. And uh, the youngest, Asma hasn't been to school. She's had no education, also because the family's living in Syria illegally. They haven't wanted to make people aware of their presence because he believes that the Iraqi militias will kidna kidnap him and uh, that they will be paid f for this service. So he's living in hiding and she's received not only no medical care but isn't going to school. Um, one, of the, one of the things that really struck me about the refugee crisis is the way Iraq had once been uh, before the war, the most educated country in the Middle East. And all of these children that I met, not only her, but th those living legally in Syria, were in school before the war. And now uh, 70 to 90 percent of those in Syria are not in school, although the Syrian government is allowing them. Syrian schools have now have 60, 70 children per classroom. Uh, if you don't have documents and if you're fleeing with, with 24 hours notice, you're not going and getting your children's report cards before you before you leave, um, or they've missed three, four years already and they don't, they don't um, go to school. And many of them are starting to, to work now to support their families, whether shining shoes or selling things in the street. I want to play parts of an interview with a young Iraqi translator named Ahmed, uh, who used to work with the American forces. Introduce us, Deborah. Uh, Ahmed is 32 years old. Uh, he worked with the Army and Marines in Fallujah. And uh, he's currently also living in hiding in Syria. I get threat from unknown people. They came to my families, asking it. Uh, they just ask them, uh, "You have a guy working with uh, USA Coastal Forces. You have to tell him to stop this job, to stop this uh, work, because it's very dangerous for him." Uh, yeah, that's that's what I will, that's what make me quit. Uh, actually, I was very afraid as. As my as my as my work as translator, it is very dangerous to work as translator, and especially if uh, the especially if the guys or the people around you, I mean your relatives or your friends, everybody know that I'm translator. That will be very dangerous. Two days ago, they, I get a phone about my friend. He was working translator before in 2004, but he quit from a long time, and they told me he was killed in front his house, uh, about 20 meters from his house, he was killed. And this is very, very sad thing happened to me. I, I don't ask about, uh, I don't insist to go to U.S. or uh, I don't choose uh, specifically a specific country. I just want to be in safe place and living in a peace. That's all what I need. No more else. And that was interviewed by Deborah Campbell and former Democracy Now! producer Jen Utes in Syria. What has happened to him since then, Deborah? Well, this is a little bit of a good news story. Uh, right now, very few uh, Iraqis are finding places abroad to be resettled. But he, uh, uh, shortly after this interview, got his phone call. And he, he's gone through six rounds of interviews over the past 16 months and finally has been accepted for resettlement in the United States. So he's just waiting for that to go through. But it looks, it looks positive, unlike the situation for a lot of Iraqis. So let's talk about the situation here in this country. Um, Congressman Dana Rohrabacher uh, of California, Republican, said, I don't think it's the time that we should be accelerating our refugee efforts. Now is the time we should be calling on the refugees from Iraq to go home. Well, I think we've seen the, the clips from Basra and we know what home looks like. The majority of Iraqis said to me that they can never go home. Even the, there were less than 50,000 that went home uh, at the end of last year during this great story about how uh, Iraqis were going home to peace and stability. Even that small number of people that went back uh, said that they did so because they'd run out of money and because Syria had, clo had, had stopped renewing their, their residency permits. So uh, the, the majority say that they 
that they'll, they may never be able to go back to Iraq, and they're facing death if they do so. What's the material support ban here? Well, after 9-11, uh, this is legislation that was expanded after 9-11, such that those refugees that are um, going for interviews to be resettled, and they, you know, they have claims and so forth, if uh, any, the material support ban essentially means that any refugee that has assisted terrorists is denied entry into the United States. That makes a lot of sense. How it's being interpreted, however, is that any refugee that has paid ransom to a kidnapper who's on the list of terrorist organizations is considered then to have materially supported terrorists. And you won't meet very many Iraqis who haven't had a family member or friend kidnap that they've had to ransom in some way. Now, the material support ban is so broadly interpreted that one uh, senior U United Nations official told me that even if a woman has been kidnapped and sexually assaulted by one of these groups and she's forced to cook for them, this is considered giving material support to terrorists. This point, um, for Iraqi refugees, they're barred from going to, blocked from going to Syria. Jordan, and where else? Everywhere else. There is no exit. I, uh, however, in January, there was a one report that 1,200 a day were still leaving Iraq from Syria. How they're doing so, I, I'm really not sure whether they're, find, they're finding their own way in at this point. You're seeing, uh, as, as, as one diplomat said to me, mortar f finds cracks to flow into. When people are desperate, they, Iraqis will do anything to get out. Well, Deborah Campbell, I want to thank you very much for being with us. Deborah Campbell, independent journalist and author, uh, spent two months embedded with Iraqi refugees in Syria, wrote a piece in the latest Harper's Magazine called Exodus, Where Will Iraq Go Next? This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. We're broadcasting on over 650 stations on Pacifica and NPR, Low Power FM, College and Community Radio stations on Public Access TV and PBS TV stations, and both TV satellite networks, Dish Network, Channel 9415 Free Speech TV, 9410 Link TV, and on Direct TV, Channel 375. And we're video and audio podcasting at democracynow.org. Our headlines are also available each day in Spanish. And every radio station can take them, as over 150 are. The transcript is also there in Spanish. As we turn now to, well, today's the birthday of Cesar Chavez, the legendary labor activist, civil rights leader, and founder of the first successful farm workers union. He would have been 81 years old today. Events are planned across the country to honor his life 